That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about On a Wing and a Prayer, which is somehow the 39th film directed by Sean McNamara, which Amazon Studios is releasing just in time for that one holiday on April 7th, 2023. I mistakenly requested this movie. I only like sort of half read about it and I assumed it would be something like that Gerard Butler movie. Plain. Plain. But it's not. It's based on a true story. W would that would it were. I wish that I, I, I would pay to not watch this film. This is definitely the worst film I've seen in 2023. And it's worse than my 2022 pick, which was Jeepers Creepers Reborn. Mm -hmm. What was your 2022 I pick? I think we both had the same. Oh, mm -hmm. do you think it's worse? This is terrible. <laughs> this is, this is, a, this is a, a steaming pile of shit that I wish, you know, if, if Jesus should come back and, and smack this <laughs> right out of the, into oblivion, because this is some bullshit. Okay, the story. After their pilot dies unexpectedly mid-flight... Doug White has to safely land a plane and save his entire family from insurmountable danger. It's based on a true story. He does successfully land the plane. The end. It's based on a true story, but this is the sci-fi version. I knew I was in trouble with the opening score because it felt like, like a sitcom we'd see on ABC Kids. Mm -hmm. And then the minute we see Dennis Quaid... <laughs> I don't know what ha happened to Dennis since The Intruder, which was just a couple of years ago. But Well, he's kind of crazy in that movie. Yeah. But he seems real unhinged in this one. Um, but the story is very simple, but there are a lot of auxiliary characters that get a lot of time and attention. Mm -hmm. And I have so many notes, I don't even know where to begin. So I'm just going to go down the line. The film opens with Doug and his family, his wife... So Doug is uh, Dennis Quaid. His wife is played by Heather Graham. Terry. Although, side note, don't you think it's funny that Heather Graham's early career, she was this unabashed nymphette, and now that she's aged uh, out of that bracket, she's now in a faith-based film? Well, that being said, I'm considering, I haven't decided yet, but I might add Heather Graham to my white gold list. Because, you know, I already have Christy Brinkley and Michelle Pfeiffer on there. Heather Graham looks fantastic. She looks good, but I would have to counter that because she's giving me Francis Fisher realness. <laughs> well, anyway, he, his wife, his two teenage children, and his brother are at like a barbecue uh, competition, mm -hmm. which I think is so funny because this barbecue competition is being held right outside like a hobo camp. Mm -hmm. And after Dennis and his brother win... They have all this leftover barbecue, so they make these little to-go plates and pass them out to all the unhoused people sitting right outside this barbecue competition. What? <laughs> Two things about that. One, like how cruel that right. not doing that. That's that, why I'm laughing. Because barbecue cool. smells really good. Yeah. But then also you give them non-biodegradable uh, containers with all that meat in it. Um, I just, it's just, a, I don't care. So that was like, I mean, that's like, what, 15 minutes in? And I felt like I was taking crazy pills. But before that even happens, we see Dennis Quaid taking flying lessons with his that's, brother. That's right. The film opens, actually, with him taking flying lessons, which, you know, the CGI is... I mean, it's it's bad for 2023 low-budget standards. Mm -hmm. So there were points when it looked like almost like a cartoon. Yeah, it, I it, would have rather watched. They just should have done a cartoon and they would have paid a... They could have saved even more money in this cut rate bullshit. So he gets home from the barbecue contest and like in the middle of the night, he gets a phone call saying that his brother's died. And his reaction is shock because he's like, I just saw my brother. Well, I guess we have to go back to Florida. So they fly out there, go to the funeral. Um... And it's at the funeral that Dennis's character is questioning his faith. The dialogue in this movie feels like a series of cliched quotes, just like all streamed together. And his character questioning his faith felt so flat. Oh. And his wife responding to him felt flat. Oh, it's bad. I mean, the acting, and which I think is a function of the dialogue and the direction. I mean, it's all terrible. I can't even think of one character who isn't terrible. There's nothing There's nothing redeeming about this film. Not at all. In fact, they even use Norman Greenbaum's Spirit in the Sky, which is about dying, as they're taking off in the fateful plane. Okay, so the string of characters. So first we meet this guy who works at the Air Traffic Control Center, but he's not a 
traffic controller. He's just like, I guess, an assistant. And we see him at a bar and this floozy is trying to pick him up and he's like getting plastered and then he shows up to work drunk. And his buddy who got him the job is like, you can't work in the air traffic control center drunk, but somehow he's still working. And that's when they get the call that the flight that Dennis Quaid and his family take back from the funeral is being piloted by a personal family friend. So they're on this private jet and the pilot has a heart attack and dies. Like what? Like as soon as they take off. Not that long into it. Yeah. Oh my God. I have another note that says this film should have been called Help Me because all Dennis Quaid is saying in the, uh, in communications to the air traffic control center is help me. Oh yeah. Help me. I need help. I need help. I need help. help me. But when he first, when he first gets through them, he's like, made it, made it, made it, made it. And that's after he's already made contact and they're asking him questions like, are you like the co-pilot? Like, and he's just saying mayday. And then he keeps saying throughout the entire film that like, I'm on the plane with my wife, my kids, like I got to get down, help me. Like, we know. Everyone knows. And increasingly, he starts to look like he's melting. He looks like Kristen Wiig in Bridesmaids when she gets food poisoning and she's <laughs> in the wedding uh, dress place. Yeah, he looks crazy. He, but, he looks like the, the beads of sweat that come up on the creme brulee crust when it's become... <laughs> but the air traffic controller guy, his boss slash friend asks him, like, when was the last time you had a drink? And his friend goes, like, the guy goes, what does that matter? Like, does he not know that you can't be drunk at work as an air traffic controller? It's so bad. Well, even even how he's drinking the shots, he drinks six, and there's It's a combination of whiskey... Tequila. Tequila. No, it's vodka, tequila, and... Another clear liquor. Gin. Yeah. <laughs> what the... F right before you go to work as a, in the air traffic control center, when we see the pilot passed out, it is inconsequential. It's like all of a sudden the camera turns and he's laid out. And then Dennis, Quaid, <laughs> Dennis Quaid's first react, response is, I just lost my brother. This isn't funny. And Dennis Quaid is a pharmacist. So he's a healthcare professional. And the way he's reacting to this man who's passed out is like, he doesn't know what to do. But also you were just taking flying lessons. I don't know what miracle happened because this whole band of people is has gotten together to help you. Well, we can get to that. Okay, so then another side character is this little girl. Who we're told at the bottom of the screen that she's an aviation enthusiast. And she's probably, what, like 11? And we find out that her dad's a pilot, but he's an absentee father. And so she's obsessed with flying. And I guess there are websites where you can track flights and hear the actual, which seems kind of like a security breach type, type of thing. But she can hear the air traffic controllers talking. So she hears that there's this pilot who's died and that the plane is, you know, in trouble. So she calls her best friend over and this little black boy comes over and he's like, he's much younger than her. Their names are Donna and Buggy. The black boy's name Buggy? Yeah. And that little black boy, when he comes over, he's like, wait, so you're listening to like the communications of a plane that's going to crash with a dead pilot on it? He goes, that's messed up. <laughs> That little girl looked like Ben Falcone to me, uh, and also th that seems like a ripoff of something like they're, they're like they're basically Trekkies, like the kids in Galaxy Quest following along, helping. So while the kids are monitoring this, we see Heather Graham has they've moved the dead pilot to the back of the plane, so now she's sitting in the co or the pilot seat. And she's reading the manual of the play. Like, what are you going to do? But we're like several many beats in where she's like, I'm, I'm looking for emergency po protocols. <laughs> then the little girl can see the flight pattern of this plane Dennis Quaid is flying. And she's dragging his flying. I thought that was so funny. But they're there ostensibly to just provide exposition for the layman, the audience. Because they really don't do anything. They, these kids served zero purpose. They are and then we get a, like, the daughter's little story with her absentee father gets wrapped up in the end. That they, served no purpose. They are a complete GD waste of time. Okay, but what I'm most confused by is the chaos that ensues at the air traffic control center. Is there not a protocol for when pilots become incapacitated on a flight? Not on Easter. They all act like they don't know what to do to the point where, like, the guy in charge, like no one in the air traffic control center is a pilot, so they don't know how to instruct him. So they, like the boss runs out into the parking lot to grab an employee who just left. 
And and as he's chasing him, like the, the employee sees him and stops his truck. And the boss runs into the truck. The the in other words, the pedestrian the pedestrian flings himself into the back of the truck, and I still am not sure how this that feels happened. more like a like an episode of Three Stooges than like a, a drama filled like like a tension filled drama about a plane out of control. And then with the, the next tangent that we that keeps pulling us is the drunkard calls his old buddy another character jesse metcalf is a very experienced pilot Carrie. whose friend who's friends with the drunk air control employee and notably in his past his parents died in the same plane because no one was able to help them literally his character's parents died in the same type of plane in a crash it's unbelievable and the his the distress that that's caused him has affected his relationship with this woman that's there Another seems- character, another storyline that well, who cares? But yeah, he has tension with his lady friend. And then we find out that it's illegal for them to have cell phones in the air traffic control center. But this drunk guy decides to call him because he wants to help. That makes no sense. It doesn't, but he has experience with this exact plane. So they agree to make an exception. Then we straight up get a montage where uh, Jesse Metcalf's girlfriend's like, I'll build you a control panel. So they- that was... I really felt like I was taking crazy pills because all of a sudden Jesse Metcalf's character has like a life-size printout of the cockpit. Yeah, of the dash. Of the, of the dash of the cockpit. And he unfolds it and then his girlfriend starts doing something and he's like, what are you doing? I'm going to build you a cockpit. Sawing shit. And this lady proceeds to build a cockpit. She is sawing things. With and- a, It makes little makeshift pedals and... Uh... And then, then that is how they were able to pull them through. Mm-hmm. Then there's a moment where the tone shifts for a second because a little girl... Because another plot point is there's weather. Like bad weather. And the little girl steps outside and all of a sudden the movie feels like an, like a, like an apocalypse The film. apocalypse is about to happen on the same day. And let's not forget that after Heather Graham becomes the co-pilot, who's no help whatsoever, uh, except to ask for what kind of help she can she can bring um one of their daughters who's been eating uh chocolate chocolate that has nuts in it and apparently she's allergic goes into anaphylactic shock and then we get a moment where her sister freaks out like what do i do and the mom's like we'll grab her backpack from the back of the plane so i'm thinking oh is it like in the like in the fuselage or or whatever you call it like it's under the plane no netting it's literally like in the back of the plane. So then the score suddenly goes into hyper Mission Impossible mode. For this girl to literally grab a backpack. And it takes her quite a bit of time. And it takes her a long time to grab this backpack. <laughs> but she does. She's able to get the EpiPen. Heather Graham, as the co-pilot's co-pilot, is just her acting. Her acting hasn't been good in a minute. But go back and watch those Flowers in the Attic remakes. There are of moments other where examples of that. she's just like... <gasps> like looking crazy. <laughs> they're, when they're in the weather part of it, and Dennis, Dennis Quaid, keep in mind, is melting. Heather Graham's like screaming at him about something. She looks out the window. You see dark clouds, and she goes, ah, ah. It's so <laughs> it's random. It's really bad. We have to shout out this terrible screenplay, though, by Brian Eggiston, who's written several episodes of Meet the Browns and House of Pain. This is, the actors are, you've done them a dis, you've done them dirty. Then there's a moment like towards the end, like when they're, like it's getting really tense because they don't know if they can land this plane. And Heather tells Dennis, we've been through bigger challenges. What could you have possibly been through that is worse than what's about to happen? Another, another point. You're about to kill your entire family by crashing an airplane. Another point she tells him, you're going to have to make it work. Otherwise you'll never get my barbecue sauce again. So then Dennis is, they've been communicating with air traffic control and then they also have like a cell phone, but then they lose contact with air traffic control. So Jesse Metcalf's character is able to call the pilot's cell phone who's dead and they pick it up and pass it to Dennis Quaid and he yells, who's that? (laughs) What? He stays screaming. He stays screaming. Um, Which I guess is a realistic performance because if you think of like... Your dad that doesn't know how to do much suddenly put in an ultra stressful situation. So then the kids are in the region of where this plane is going to crash land, like at the airport. So they decide, the the, the two little kids, that they're going to ride their bikes to the airport. Like like the kids in E.T. Yes. And these two kids are able to get through the gate to get onto the tarmac. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, if these two kids can get onto the tarmac, then why do they make me take my shoes off at the airport? 
Doesn't that make pre-check seem real iffy? I was so annoyed. And then the security guard does see them. And it's and the security guard is in a motor vehicle. Uh-huh. And does not catch up to them until that plane has safely landed and those kids are like a rock's throw distance from the plane. Who wrote that? Like what? Brian, Brian Eggiston wrote this and I don't care enough to try to read what really happened, but I know this is, it has to be embellished. Again, this is the sci-fi version of this tale. So as they're playing the plane, Jesse Metcalf is telling Dennis Quaid, you need to let go of all the, of like the yoke and the, the pedals. And so he's like, let go, Doug. And then Doug just goes, ah, like he just lets go of everything. Very Tammy Brown. Ah. So finally, when the plane lands, everyone's like happy. And then the the one guy who got, who had already left work and they catch up with him to bring him back. I just thought, I hope he got paid his overtime. Oh, that's what I thought he was so enthousi- enthusiastic about. Like his check was going to be real good. Then the drunk air traffic controller guy runs onto the tarmac when the plane lands. Mm-hmm. I don't know that he needed to do that. He didn't, but he seems real invested. And then he, he gets a book into his tale with the woman at the bar because... This experience, also notably, his cell phone stops working and we're told it never worked again. Isn't that eerie? And uh, and then goes back to the bar where immediately. he... Immediately. Immediately goes back to the bar where that same woman is performing. This woman, I think her character's name is Linda, who's doing some country music twangy thing on stage. The, her song is still playing and then she comes to sit by him, which makes no sense. And then he uh, supposedly has given up drinking and he just came there to tell her that and asked her to get coffee with him to help him pick out a new cell phone. He needed to leave that tramp where he found her. Um, The movie is like an hour 45, and the last 15 minutes is just like, I've never experienced so many, like, I don't even know how you refer to it, where they're trying to, like, tie up loose ends, and then they have, like, during the credits. But it all starts with a very long rendition of Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen Return of the King. That has a lot of uh, things to wrap up at the end of that movie. But during the final credits, it's just, it goes on forever. We just get photographs of the real people and what they're up to, but it's all so arbitrary and like, who cares? We start getting things, I'm like, who are these? Are these the girls and they're their kids? We even get like... Why do I care that she's a pharmacy tech in Wisconsin? We even get... Well, she's a pharmacist, not a pharmacy tech. Oh, but uh, <laughs> but we even get a t- like a, a photo saying that the dead pilot was buried. And he was a good man. Great. Did anyone not think they would bury him? And then they even say, like, Doug visits him often. Good okay. for Doug. Uh, and then I, I, I also have to point out, because it was blood-curdlingly bad, the girl that played the younger daughter, as soon as she opens her mouth, thankfully she's the one that goes into anaphylactic shock and she stops does not... Talking. She stops talking. Because every time she speaks, it is... It's grating. It's grating. It's like Joey Lauren Adams, except I don't mind that actor. Ugh. The only sort of interesting thing about this film is that based on the end credits, it appears that two of the actual people who were white were played by black actors. So that's interesting because we usually see the opposite. We usually see that. And it's so, a, I, you know. It doesn't matter because uh, all of them are uh, at a disadvantage with the script. So whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. For the people that are into this and write this, like, doesn't, doesn't Jesus want quality acting and writing in the productions that are... Okay, we're going to stop there. What would you give this film? Uh... Because, again, I don't believe in zeros. This should be in the negatives of whatever. But a 0.5, which is the lowest possible score I will ever give anything. I will give it 0.5 out of 5. However, if you do decide to watch it, I think you should watch it with people and alcohol if you drink. Anything else? Won't he do it? Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.